Hello everyone from a hot and sunny Dubai. In this video I'm going to be introducing you to color work on the circular sock machine. It's an introductory video so the details will be for beginners through to people who are a little bit more um, intermediate in their skills and we will only be covering unfortunately a few techniques as um, time is a constraint but it will give you a good grounding in how to work color work the way that I work it. It's not the only way to work color work. There are many, many different people um, who have shown the way that they do color work on their machines, but this is the way I do it. And I hope it'll be a useful video and I hope that you'll find it something you'd like to do um, when you knit your socks on your machine. I have broken down the video into different sections and I'll be using a chart as seen on the screen to be able to guide you through the different techniques, starting with simple stripes and working our way up through more complex um, charts. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I knit stripes on my sock machine. Stripes are a very simple form of color work, but it's really easy to do stripes once you have the technique down pat, and it makes it a lot easier to have a rotating mast. The rotating mast might be homemade or might have been purchased, but it definitely works better than using your normal upright and topper that goes into the side of the machine. So just to go through the basics of the cylinder setup, it is pure preference for me that I try to always start the beginning of the round at the six o'clock position. And you'll see that on the cylinder marked with a pink dot. There it is. On the right, that orange mark indicates the right hash mark. On the left, the orange is the left hash mark. 12 o'clock is this blue mark over here. And don't worry about the red marks. Those are just heel turn marks. They're not relevant for stripes. Okay, so I have worked in waist yarn and then I've done a few inches of background yarn. It doesn't really matter um, what you start with as this is just a demonstration. Plain stockinette, no ribbing and I'm now at the beginning of the round and I'm ready to start making the first two row pink stripe, two round pink stripe. I'm going to just show you very simple two round alternating stripes because I mean you can change the, the number of color stripes per color to whatever you like. It's just to show you the technique. Okay, a little bit of background. Hand knitters, when knitting color work, for example in Tarsia, will use a little phrase to remember how to twist their yarns and that phrase is old over new. So when they knit they put the old yarn over the new. However hand knitters work from right to left and when working circularly for example sleeves, socks, hats, if it's a, a seamless construction they will be knitting in a clockwise direction. Sock knitters knit mostly anti-clockwise. We're talking about plain stockinette here. So everything is swapped around. So for sock knitters, the phrase to remember is new over old. And I'll be demonstrating exactly how you twist that, uh, use that to twist the yarns. Okay, I'm not using the upright topper and mast that came with my machine at all, only the rotating mast. I have got two colors here that are just fed through the top of the mast. There are no heel springs. It's plain knitting. Okay, so now I'm ready to start with the first pink stripe. When you get to the point where the latch has closed on the last needle of the round, which is the needle just before the pink mark, but the latch is still open on the needle just to the right of the pink mark. So this one over here, you will take out the old color and place it in the cylinder. Now I like to use a little weighted clip because it makes things neater and tidier and easier for me to see where I am. I'll put that on the white yarn and I let it drop into the cylinder. Now I'm ready to put my pink yarn. Now remember what I was saying about old over new versus new over old? Okay, we are sock machine knitting so new over old. That's all you have to remember, new over old. I use a little weighted clip as well on the first, um, the beginning of the round because I have a yarn tail. So I will put a clip on the yarn tail 
and now I'm ready to um, put it into my yarn guide my yarn carrier so place it so that the yarn falls just to the left of the first needle of the round which is the needle just past the pink mark and now let's prepare so that we can be sure to have new over old and how are we going to do that you make sure that your pink lies to the left of the white so so that is how it looks when you raise up the white you'll see that the pink comes over the white so new over old okay now I'm going to just simply knit two rounds make sure that your latches are all open and knit okay now an interesting thing because this is the first stripe in the pink we haven't really twisted the yarns to close the little gap where the color change occurs yet so these two bits of yarn coming from the mast haven't tangled once we start twisting the yarns there will be a tangle but there is a very easy way to undo that and I'll show that to you in the next section okay so we've knit the first pink color round which is two rounds at the point where the latch closes on the last needle of the round just before the pink mark take your yarn out okay and you're going to place it again into the center of the cylinder with a little clip weight just as you did with the white so I take the clip weight off the the whites plonk it on the pink and all you have to remember to ensure new over old is take the new yarn to the left take the old yarn to the right and drop it in okay now you're ready to knit with white again so bring your white yarn to your yarn carrier let me see if I can zoom in a little bit there we go okay so now your yarn is ready to be knit the white yarn what you can do is give a little tug on this white yarn and you might just see in the camera that as I pull it draws the hole closed that would occur naturally between the color change points so in the first few stitches I'll give a little tug on that and once two or three stitches have knit then I will just knit so we're going to do two rounds there we go now you can see that there is already one twist actually a half twist in the two yarns once we've done the next two there will be a full twist and then I will show you how to undo the, the twist okay so unthread the white bring it to the center of the cylinder put your yarn clip on there with a little weight make sure that you put the pink yarn behind the first needle of the round and we're going to give a little tug to close that hole not too tight just enough where you see the hole closing and notice that I put the white towards the right and I brought the new from the left okay so now I've done two stripes there okay now I'm going to zoom out so you can see that the yarns have started to tangle So we've got a, a tangle here it's a full twist there's a very easy way to untwist this so what I'm going to do is give a little tug oh wait hang on I'm going to change my yarn first so the last pink stitch has knitted I'm going to take the pink out put the clip on it drop it towards the right of the new yarn I'm going to place the new yarn into the yarn carrier I'm going to knit give a little tug and two or three stitches and now I'm going to undo this tangle and it's as simple as this you take the mast out of the place where it's mounted in the river mount hole and in the same direction that you crank you are going to just move the mast around in a direction like that so clockwise and then put it back in its place 
and now you can see that the two yarns are again untangled so let's do another two white stripes or white rounds again get to the last stitch undo the white to the right of the new yarn put the little yarn clip on drop it in the cylinder bring the pink yarn around the first needle of the round put it into the yarn carrier give a little tug and there you go when your yarns tangle again you can untwist by taking the rotating mast out of the place it's on the the camshell anti-clock um anti-clockwise rotation to untangle put it back so that is a very simple way and quick way to do stripes you will have a little line of interlocking um, stitches I'll just see if the camera can see that again you'll have a line of interlocking um, not stitches threads here so that you won't have any holes appearing when the um, sock is off the machine and that's really simple how to do stripes In this section I'm going to start showing you how to do very very simple fair isle. We now know how to work stripes and now I want to introduce a small amount of stranded color work into a stripe. So here is an example that I worked on. You can see that these are essentially three round stripes and the middle round has got a little bit of a fair isle pattern to it. So it's a simple thing to do you knit one solid color stripe, one fair isle row, and one normal row again. So plain row, fair isle row, plain row. And using it again, the mask makes a big difference to this. It's a lot easier, a lot quicker. Um, so I'll show you how to do that next. Okay, on the chart, I've drawn up a chart with the basic things that we've been doing and that we will do in the future. Here is the chart for the for the section with a stripe that has some fair isle. You can see I've marked my chart so that we have a direction of knitting from left to right and the beginning of the round is from that side. At that point you can see where the right hash mark or 3 o'clock is, 12 o'clock with the blue and again the left hash mark over here. Now remember just because this is on the right side of the chart doesn't mean it's not the left hash mark. Okay so these lines I put in because they help you in complicated um, patterns. For example this is a lot more complex than a simple fair isle um, stripe with alternating stitches. Um, it's a lot easier to keep your place and if you have a very complex pattern that doesn't follow a rhythm like three white one red three white one red you may find that it makes it even easier for you to put additional markings for example if your round repeats is let's say six stitches I would on my chart put in extra things uh, extra lines to show that way it's easy to keep track where you are on the machine okay so we are going to work the first blue round over here which is a plain round now there are two ways of doing this at the moment I have got my rotating mast loaded with the two colors the background color which is white and the dark blue I can now undo the white I've allowed the latch to close on the last needle of the round I'm going to take the little weight I'm going to put it on and I'm going to drop it to the right of the pink now I'm not going to go through how to weave in ends at this point so there's enough to learn one thing at a time but when I would be working confidently with stripes and ferrule I would weave this in between needles so that I don't have to work these tail ends in at a later stage by hand but for now let's just do this okay so I'm going to load the blue yarn into the yarn carrier and I'm going to knit one plain round there we go 
Okay, now at the point where the last stitch of the round has, uh, the last needle has closed its latch, that round is now complete. I'm going to take the clip, actually you need a few clips, and I'm going to put it into the uh, center of the um, cylinder. And now I'm ready to start doing the fair aisle section. Now if we look back at the, the chart, you can see that we have blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. The way that I use these magnetic markers is I place them at the point where I am just able to see the round that I'm working on. Some people put them under, but it's not an ideal thing because you can't see what lies beneath the round you're working. The round to come doesn't matter. What matters is where the current to be worked row and that color work lies in relation to the one worked before it. So I find this is a lot easier to, to work with. Okay, so we're starting at the left. Blue, white, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. Simple. So we're going to have one needle loaded with a blue yarn, one with white, one with blue, one with white. That is really the simplest fair isle or stranded knitting that you can get. And it's very easy to do with the mast. Okay, the important thing is take the yarns out of the yarn carrier and I'm actually going to remove my yarn carrier. Now, if you haven't got a slotted yarn carrier, it may be worthwhile investing in one. Um, color work is very, very, very laborsome and yeah, not fun to do if you don't have a slotted yarn carrier. I've placed the yarn into the heel springs so that a little bit of tension is applied and it makes the knitting of the ferrule round easier. Okay, now we're finally ready to start knitting ferrule. I find that with very small patterns, in other words, two color stitches um, alternating, it's easier for me to use my pick to place the yarn. With longer repeats, I use my fingers. So we've seen from the chart that the first stitch of the round, which is the first one past the pink mark, is going to be a blue stitch. Now the setup is such that at the moment my blue yarn is in the front and by that I mean it is closer to me than the white yarn which is closer to the center of the cylinder. It's important for ferrule knitting to maintain what's called yarn dominance and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But for now the most important thing to know is that the yarn that stays closest to the cylinder stays closest to the cylinder all the way while you're working round and the yarn that is closest to me stays closest to me working all the way around. You will make some changes to this depending on whether you are going to be weaving your floats for longer pattern repeats um, but for now let's start with the simple things. Okay so I'm going to place the first stitch um, yarn using my pick into the hook. Then I'll take from the back the white yarn and place it into the hook of the next stitch. So this yarn, the blue one, is still in front and the white yarn comes from behind. You might sometimes be tempted to do this and bring the white across the front. That's not right. If you had a, um, swapped the yarns around and the blue was at the back, you would keep the blue at the back. If the white was in the front, you'd keep it at the front. And in this way, you go all the way around, always keeping to the positioning you started with. So now we have got a blue yarn in the first hook. I'm going to put the white yarn in the second needle. And now I'm going to crank forward. Now watch where I stop. The latch of the blue stitch has closed, but the white one hasn't, and now it is closed. When I get to that point, I will then place the next stitches and this is a simple fair I'll repeat so of course it's going to be blue white blue white again keeping the white at the back make sure whoops make sure that you have the positions the same it looks very slow but once you've got the hang of this it goes a lot faster I've now placed both stitches I'm going to crank forward a little bit until the latch of the second color has closed why do I do that? Some people might be tempted to do this, where they place a whole bunch of these 
stitches in a row to crank much more. But can you see the problem? With very small repeats, this blue yarn is going to be trapped in the incorrect needle. So let's pretend we put it behind and we keep wanting to go, you know, along like this. It's not going to work. Your tensions are going to be different. The best way to do it is two color changes at a time and stick to that. So let's go again. Blue at the front, first stitch. Whoops, there we go. And white at the back. Now, why I work to the point where the last knitted color, the latch, is closed is as you can see, the blue yarn will strand across or will, will pass across the last knitted needle. And if that latch was open, it would be caught in the hook of that needle and it would be knitted and your pattern would be spoiled. Okay, so now I'm going to put my blue in place and I'm going to crank forward. And I'm going to repeat this all the way around. Make sure the last knitted stitch, the latch is closed, and then place your yarns whoops, for the next one. And in this way, you'll work all the way around until your row is done. That's very simple simple pattern fair owl knitting. It's easy to do, it goes a lot quicker once you've got the hang of it and you know you're not talking on a video and what's very nice about it is because your heel springs are engaged and you have the lightest possible weight keeping tension on these yarns. You can see there's very very little tension. The only tension you need is to provide a little bit of pull up into the hook of the needle. Um, once you've done that, your stitches really come out evenly. In hand knitting, one of the problems is sometimes that you know people knit unevenly, and the colours might um, pull in in some areas, and other areas it might be looser. Specifically, because you're using a yarn mast that provides even tension throughout, and you have evenly spaced needles that provide a platform for the even tension to be worked across, your fair hour comes out a lot cleaner looking and the patterns are more visible. I'm now at the point where I've finished the fair owl round and I'm going to put back my yarn carrier. If you have a fair owl pattern that has a solid round in between a section where there's fair owl, you can put back your yarn carrier if it's more than you know maybe a row. If it's not I tend to just keep on using the fair owl method where I will hook the color that needs to be used into each of the hooks, crank a few um, needles and carry on. It's actually quicker than putting the yarn carrier on and off. But if there's a section where you have several rounds, I will just put it back and I will thread the color I'm going to use. Oops, it's actually the blue. We need to finish the blue. So now I'll bring the blue to the front because there's no yarn dominance anymore. This is a solid color round and I will just crank around. And there my pattern is finished. Okay, I'll swap out the two colors now as I'll do two rounds of white before I start the next virile section. And here again, you can link your colors by bringing new over old. So old to the right, new to the left, Put the yarn into the carrier and you can see there's a bit of a twist in your, your um, working yarns but it's only half a twist so I'm going to carry on and I'm going to knit a couple of rounds in plain white. In the next section we'll look at doing a longer repeat of stitches um, using um, a pattern that makes a very pretty leaf decoration and that will be even easier than what we've done is you'll use your hands to place the yarns. In this part of the, the video I'm going to show you a little bit of a more complicated ferrule pattern. Um, very simple to execute but has a little bit more detail than a simple one by one stitch. So we're working on this pattern over here, the green leaf pattern. Let me just bring this down here like that. 
and again we're working left to right in that direction and here we see that it's a very simple pattern that starts with three green three white three green three white and so on on the first round so let's do that next I've loaded the ferrule mast with the green that I intend to use. The white yarn hasn't been cut and I'm going to show you how to place yarn into hooks using just your hands. So remember this is the beginning of the round so in order for us to um, make this these first three stitches green we need to bring new over old. I use the yarn clips again to provide a pull down of the I'll just get them out here of the yarn tails and the yarn that's not being used so I'm going to put the clip on the white let it hang in the cylinder my heel springs are still engaged and now I'll bring the green yarn from the left So I know the first three stitches are going to be green. So I simply take the yarn and place it across the first three needles of the round. I'm going to crank forward to the point where the latch of the last knitted stitch has closed over there, but the next long stitch still has the latch open. This is now secured and I can put a little tail clip on there. And now I will bring this yarn from um, the back because remember we're maintaining yarn dominance. So the white started at the back, the green came to the front. So now I'm going to place the yarn into the next three. Crank forward, next three. And notice that the green yarn always comes into the hooks at the front and the white yarn at the back. Make sure that your latches are always open. Whoops, there we go. And because you have the heel springs engaged, there's a little bit of tension applied which keeps the yarn in the hooks of the needles. And in this way, I just go all the way around. Make sure that your latches are open on the new needles as you go around. And it's as simple as that. I try to get into the habit of cranking with my right hand and placing yarn with my left hand. But on some areas in the cylinder you might find it easier just to actually use both hands. Okay, so now we're back at the beginning of the round and my last three stitches are white. So I'm going to crank until the latch of the last knitted stitch is closed. Now let's have a look at the chart again. Okay, so we see that the next round over here starts with one white stitch. And then the pattern repeats. Three green, three white, three green, three white. So we'll work the one stitch and then repeat exactly what we did. Oops, sorry. I have to bring the green from the front. Oops, I went a little too far there, so now I need to open the latch of this needle to place the green. One has to not crank too far past because the latch of the, the stitch will close and then you'll have to manually open it and place the yarn. So just work a little bit at a time. And 
the last two stitches on the chart were white so I'll knit those then I look at my chart again and start again with the first stitch of the round the first needle and in this way you can place yarn quite quickly into needle hooks for for patterns that are easy repeats as you just keep going round and round so that's a second way to work fair isle um, using the rotating mast In this next section of our sample of, um, chart, we are going to work on a pattern that requires floats to be stranded. So what this means is that you want to anchor floats along a section where there are a number of stitches of the same color in a row. And you don't want to end up with a long thread behind these color sections. So we are going to anchor them. So let's look at the chart. I hope this can focus. Over here, we're going to start with this section. This is the little working area. On the first row we have two white stitches, a red stitch, and then there are five white stitches. Now, I don't like to have anything longer than three stitches worth of thread behind, as we did, for example, in the green um, and white chart. So what I do is I strand this. So at that point in the middle of this block of white stitches there are five white I will use that little mark that I put on my chart it's a little red dot it doesn't indicate a color change to me it indicates that I need to anchor the red float that was last knitted over here the red stitch there and there and that will make the area not have um, loops that basically you can snag your fingers or toes on depending on what you're working with in the same way you'll see in the section where there's a lot of red, five red stitches in a row, I will use that little red um, white dot to indicate that I want to catch the white float at that point. That means that there aren't any long pieces of white in this section of the chart. Okay, let's look at the first row of this patterning section. We start with two white stitches, a red stitch, and then we've got a section of five white stitches and we are going to trap the red on the third of those five stitches. So let's do that practically on the machine. I've loaded my um, mast with a new color, the red, and I have fed that through the heel spring. I've placed a clip on the red and now I'm going to start um, working the chart. For this demonstration, as this is purely an introduction at this point, I'm going to use the simplest means of doing this. So I'm going to take the yarn that is closest to the center of the cylinder, which is also the dominant yarn, and I'm going to use that to work at the back. The white yarn will now come to the front. There are reasons for this. Um, the video is, well, there's too little time to go through every technique as it's only an introduction. And um, this is the simplest way to show the principle. Okay, so on our chart we have two white stitches, so I'm going to, sorry, place two white, in, um, the white yarn into two hooks of the first two stitches, crank forward until the latch closes on the last worked stitch. I'm now going to take the red and I'm going to place it into the next stitch because that, according to our chart, is the next color to be worked. Okay, now I know I have got five stitches that are in white. I'm going to work two of them, and then I'm going to place my red yarn in this way. From the back, I bring it round, I put it under the latch, and I take it to the back and hold with my finger. Place the white into the next three stitches so that that will give you effectively one, two, three, four, five white stitches. And you keep the red at the back, crank forward till the latch closes on the last knitted stitch. And then, as per our chart again, we're going to use the red to knit the next stitch. Then again, we have got five white. But I'm only going to work two, then I'm going to take my red, bring it to the front, around the back of the white like that, 
under the latch, put it in the center of the cylinder, hold it there, make sure that this latch stays open, and then I'm going to put the white into the next three. So we'll have again uh, one, two, three, four, five white, but the red is being stranded behind the middle white stitch. Okay, and I'm a little bit caught around the camera here. But that is a basic showing of how you would catch this float. Now there is a different technique that one can use called e-wrapping, which also um, hides the floats um, or lessens the amount of um, distance between stitches by um, catching the float in a middle stitch or one of the stitches across that span. I can show that in a different video at a later stage, but this is the simplest way of using um, the method to catch your, your floats across long pieces. I've now worked the second row of our design over there, which is a simple pattern using three colors of the red, three white, three red, three white, which you've done before. The next row has got five red stitches and there again is your little white dot. Now that indicates to me that I need to anchor the float, the white float, in the middle stitch of that section and that's what I'll show you next. I've worked round two as you can see and I'm ready to start round three as I showed you a moment ago using the red. So we know that the first five stitches are going to be red. We're going to do exactly the same thing as we did before where we anchor the white float this time in the middle of the section of red. So we start again by working the first two stitches of the red and now we need to take this white to the back. Floating um, anchoring only occurs working from the back. So we bring the white to the back, to the front around that middle anchoring stitch under the latch, take it back again and hold it in the center of the cylinder. Now we know that we need another three red stitches, so we place the red yarn in the next three hooks. That will give you five red stitches with one um, anchor uh, of the white in the middle. Crank forward until the last stitch has knitted. And now we are going to bring the white to the front because the next stitch is the white. Unfortunately, this is more complicated than the previous way to show you because for a moment your yarn dominance might be thrown out, but then you re-establish it. So I'll crank until the latch is closed on the white. Now I'm going to bring the red again to knit the first two stitches. I bring the white to the front, oh, sorry, to the back under the latch. Make sure the latch is open and knit the next three. So again, you have got one, two, three, four, five red. Then we'll knit our white again because that's the next color on our chart. And that is how you would anchor the floats. In this video, I'll be showing you the second method that you can use to anchor long floats. In the previous method we used a simple um, weaving I guess you could say where the yarn to be anchored just weaves in front and under the latch of the anchoring stitch and then back again to the back. It's a simple straight line of the yarn. The e-wrap method as I call it is a little more flexible as there is a little more um, thread available for that anchor. And it's not difficult to do. I would recommend that you use it especially over areas where you have a very long section of the same color. Um, it makes the puckering effect of anchoring floats a little less obvious. I also particularly like this method because to my mind at least it's less visible when looking at the right side of the fabric. You can try both methods and see which one works best for you. I'll be using the same chart as we did for the section over here and as per the chart we start again with two white stitches 
a red and then we have five white so I'm going to put two white crank forward a little and then I'll bring in the red so we've got one red and now we've got five white stitches we have to work through okay as before I will place only the first two white and then I'm going to use the e-wrap to anchor this red and it's very similar to what we did previously except in the method well in the way that you place the yarn so again we come from the back bring the yarn previously we did this where we came around the left hand side of the needle under the latch and to the back this time we're going to come from the opposite side so between the two next two unknitted stitches we'll go under the latch and to the back can you see that it's erect again make sure that your latch is open hold the anchoring yarn in the cylinder just with your finger and now we place the working yarn through three more um, needle hooks so we'll get a total of five one two three four five white stitches keep your finger on the red yarn crank forward until the latch is closed on the last needle to be knitted then as per the chart we again have a red stitch so we bring the red yarn into the next hook the latch is closed and now we prepare for the next one so again we've got five white stitches and we need to anchor the red float on number three so I'll put two white again take the red yarn to the back bring it around to the right of the needle that will act as the anchor under the latch hold it in the cylinder with your left hand open the latch place the white yarn into the next three stitches which will give you a total of five stitches as you need for the chart go until the latch is closed again place the red as that is our next um, color per the chart what effectively happens is that the red yarn goes in a little call it a shadow behind the white stitch that is being knitted it almost follows the shape of the stitch but if you do stretch the fabric that little loop gives a bit more play and doesn't pull as tight so it's a very nice method to use in the next video I'll show you how we do it if for example um, we need to change colors from front to back and that will be the third round of your chart where we have got five red stitches and we need to anchor the white in the middle of that section of five on the third needle. I've now completed round two as per the chart. I'm going to try and just see if this will focus to show. Okay, so we've done round two and now we've got round three. Round three starts with five red stitches, white, five red white and so on I've indicated that we need to anchor the white float on the third needle of this five stitch or five needle section over here and I will show you how to do that now okay so we know that we're going to start with two red out of the five and we keep the orientation of the yarns the red is at the back closest to the center of the cylinder the white is closest to me so the red is the dominant yarn. Crank forward until the latch is closed. And now we're going to do the E-wrap um, anchoring. Even though the white yarn is the yarn in front and closest to me, always when you do an anchoring, regardless of the method that you use, you have to work from the back. So we take the white yarn to the back and we're going to E-wrap it around this third needle here so the easiest way to do that is to bring it to the right of the needle you're going to e-wrap around use your finger to close the latch bring it around that needle pinch with your left hand in the cylinder open your latch take the red place it on the three stitches we need to give us five red 
crank forward until the latch on the last red stitch is closed. Now we've got a white stitch to work as per the chart. You will bring the white to the front again, knit that white stitch. Going from behind, we'll do the next five red stitch repeat. Do the first two, take your white to the back, bring it around the right of the anchoring needle, use your finger to close the latch, wrap it around in an e-wrap, pinch with your left hand the white yarn in the cylinder, open the latch, take the red into the next three hooks, the red is closed, bring the white to the front and knit the stitch. The benefits of this method using an e-wrap rather than just a, a straightforward stranding across the front of the needle as we did in the previous method is that there's a little bit more thread in the anchoring area and this allows for you to have a stretchier section especially if there are a lot of these um, e-wrap anchors so for example if you had a section of chart that had 10 red stitches you might want to anchor the white across every third needle that little bit of wrap around the needle gives you more flexibility in the knitting and you'll see less of an effect um, of pulling in of the fabric in that area. What's also nice about it is personally I find it's less visible on the front of the work and it forms almost like a little shadow behind the main stitch of that needle. Um, it's a little bit um, trickier just because you have to close the latch, make sure you open the latch but it's really not difficult and once you have the hang of it, it's a really nice effective method to anchor your floats. In this next section I'm going to show you how I add an extra colour to a round. I don't usually use three colours per round but it is nice to have an extra pop of colour just for a small motif where you pre-cut a length of yarn that you know will be enough for the round and then um, add that to points in the pattern just to add a little bit of an extra element. Okay, my ferrule mast has got two cone holder points and two heel springs. So how do you add the third color? Well, I make a yarn butterfly. I just drape it with a little weight clip and it's a very light weight clip over the top of the mast and then I run it down into the cylinder. So let's get started on the next section. Let's look at the chart before we start knitting. The motif we'll be working is essentially the same as the one we did before but what we've done here is we've added a blue stitch to the center of each red diamond. So let's start with the beginning of the round. We've got two red stitches, then we stitch, we have a blue stitch, and here you can also see you need to anchor the white. Because the last time you worked with the white was at the end of the previous round, and you don't want a long float stretching between these sections. So there's a proper white stitch, there's a proper white stitch. So you can see there's a span of five stitches in between, which is why we need to anchor the white. So two red, a blue stitch with a white anchor, two red, a white stitch with a blue anchor, two red, blue stitch, white anchor, two red, white stitch, blue anchor, and so on. Let's do that on the machine now. Okay, I'm at the point where I'm going to start um, with two red stitches. So we keep our yarn dominance. I bring the red from the back, place it into the two hooks and I go until the latch of the last knitted stitch is closed. Now I'm going to introduce the blue. The blue stays at the back and we'll keep that orientation throughout. So we have a blue stitch, but before we knit the blue stitch, we need to anchor that white. So when it comes to um, the anchoring section, anchor takes precedence over stitch knitting. So in the previous episodes of the video we showed, I showed you where you first anchor, then you put the, the correct um, color yarn into the hook. So we're first going to anchor the white, and I'll just do the e-wrap for ease, like that. So 
make sure your latch is open. Now I'm going to introduce the blue and it helps to have a weighted clip on the end because it makes things easier for the yarn to, to have a little bit of tension as this is the first blue stitch you're going to be knitting. So let's recap. Two red wrapped white blue stitch. Now we crank forward until the latch is closed. Now we've got two red again but um, you leave your white and you'll see now we'll re-establish yarn dominance when we go to the next white knitted stitch. So now we have two red again and you go until the latch is closed. Now we're going to bring the white to the front but remember we need to wrap the blue now. So again the blue goes to the back. I'm just doing the e-wrap method. Open the latch, bring your white to the front because the white is actually the yarn that's always closest to me. Go until the latch is closed. Now we've got two red stitches again. Bring the red around and you can see I'm bringing it from behind the white. Go until the latch is closed. Okay, so the next one again is a blue stitch but we need to wrap the white yarn. So I take the white yarn to the back behind all of the, the working threads, do the wrap, make sure that your latch is open, take your blue yarn from behind the red, go until the latch is closed. Now we've again got two red stitches. So we take the red yarn in front of the blue go until the latch is closed on the last knitted stitch. Okay, now we have a white yarn again, but we need to wrap the blue. So we take the blue from the back, and you'll notice my little yarn bobbin is hanging here. So if you need more yarn, if you know how to make a yarn butterfly, you just drag the thread out, and you have a little bit more for, uh, for you to knit with. So we take the blue to the back, we wrap around the next stitch will be the white. Make sure your latch is open. Okay, and now we're going to knit with a white yarn and the, the white always comes to the front. Hold down the blue yarn at the back, go until the white latch is closed. Okay, the next um, two stitches are again red. So we bring the red from behind the white, place them into the hooks, and crank until the latch is closed. And in this method you can, you can prevent long floats, but also use an extra color to add small sections of a third design element to your, your ferrule row. It is a more complicated design because you need to keep track of where your wraps are, where um, you know, things need to not go too long before you knit the next stitch. But if you have a well-planned chart, you can follow it along and it makes things a lot easier. In this section, I'm going to go over briefly what the concept of yarn dominance is. Yarn dominance is something we mostly speak about in hand knitting, um, not so much on sock machine knitting, but it has important value to um, sock knitters as well. When I discuss the different positions of the two yarns, one closer to the center of the cylinder and one closer to the cranker, those positions are important. Now a hand knitter would for example have, let's say they were using two hands to knit fair aisle, you might have a yarn in the left hand and a yarn in the right hand. The yarn in the left hand would be what we call the dominant yarn. It has to travel a little bit further across the back of the work than the yarn that is closest to the knitter. And as such, the stitches are a little bit bigger. So if you look at the swatch, I worked both of these with the same tension, same weight stack, everything was the same except for two things. In the first swatch over here, the white yarn was dominant. In other words, I kept it towards the center of the cylinder and I kept the pink towards myself. In the top swatch, 
I reversed that. The pink yarn was dominant, i.e. closest to the center of the cylinder, and the white yarn was closest to me. Now you can see there is a subtle difference between the two. In the lower swatch, the white stitches look bigger than in the top swatch, even though the pattern is exactly the same. And it may not be apparent in a small sample of fair arm knitting or color work. Usually it comes um, into play more obviously with larger swatches, as you can see. Now, it doesn't seem to make a big difference, but if you were to work, for example, a fair isle um, sock that was fair isle completely from top to bottom, you would notice a very big difference between one where you held the white yarn to the back or one where you held the pink yarn to the back. So on very small pieces of fair isle, for example a small checkerboard, it may not be that obvious, but if you are going to be working bigger pieces of fair isle, it's something to keep in, in mind. For sock machine knitting, the yarn that is closest to the center of the cylinder, we will call the dominant yarn. And maintaining those positions will make sure that you not only have even stitches, um, because if you keep swapping them around, some white stitches may appear bigger than others within the same row. So if you keep them in the position that you started with, your pattern will develop with the same look throughout. And that brings me to the end of this video. This is only an introduction to color work on the sock machine. I know there are many other kinds of color work that one can do, including mosaic knitting, argyle, intarsia, but I hope it's been clear enough for you to follow along and try this technique. I want to say thank you as well to Jim and Amy for organizing this virtual cranking. You guys are awesome. Goodbye and have a great day, guys.